Hi, I'm Janice Switlow. I want to share some very important information that is not generally well known, at least at this point. Uh, in December 2022, the federal government passed the Fall Economic Statement Implementation Act 2022. This act among other things, the most important for our purposes today, it repealed and replaced the First Nations uh, Land Management Act, FNLMA. And as you know, I've spent a lot of time analyzing the land management regime. The new act, so that act's totally revoked, the new act is called the Framework Agreement on First Nation Land Management Act. So the new uh, initials are F-A-F-N-L-M-A. So you can see I'm reading that. <laughs> uh, and basically what it, it's a very short act now. And it achieves two critical uh, points in favor of Canada, if you will, in terms of getting these things in place. A lot of people have been refusing to pass land codes. They understand that putting, once a land code is passed, the First Nation Land Management Act regime uh, gets put into place. And what that means is that they've handed there's no more coming to them to approve developments. For example, the chief and council can proceed um, uh, based on, on that land code. And also important to know that any amendments to that land code, of course, are not then controlled by the people, but they're controlled by the chief and council. So for instance, I'm going to speak about uh, what just happened at Rosso River and Shnabi Nation. They uh, are one of seven bands that achieved a settlement that put a joint reserve in place in the center of Winnipeg. And they wanted to, there's a corporation formed and they wanted to have each band pass a land code so that the corporation, that then it would uh, pass the authorities to the chief and council, but in, in turn pass those authorities to this corporation. And then in turn, the corporation has set up a development corporation, and so they'll basically lease the lands to the development corporation and then have their way with it, if you will, with no necessarily any way of uh, ensuring returns and benefits to band members. So one of these bands being Rosso River and Anishinaabe Nation, as I said, had their land code vote recently. Now there are eight, there are 20, 2,740 registered band members as of September, uh, 2023. Of those, there are, I'm told, 1,800 eligible voters, that is, band members who are 18 years and older. So 1,800 eligible, eligible to vote. 206 showed up to vote, 39 voted no, and 167 voted yes. Those 167 votes, because they were a majority of the 206 people who showed up was enough to pass the land code. That's pretty shocking. When you think of most, con at least condominiums in um, uh, strata councils for condominiums in British Columbia, for example, you need a 75% plus one vote in order to change a bylaw for a condo. Uh, so, this is not even uh, 10%, 167 out of 1,800 eligible voters, enough to affect a land code. How could that be, right? How, how is that possible? It used to be, when this first came out, that you had one vote and you needed to obtain 
50% plus one of the total eligible voters voting yes it before land code would be passed. Then the Harper government introduced a change that said, uh, oh, well, you know, if you don't get it the first time round, but the majority of those who showed up then for that first vote voted in favor, then you can hold a second vote. And in that second vote, you only need to achieve an outcome of 25% plus one of eligible voters in order to pass the land code. That's all gone now. That act is revoked. The new act says, follow what's in the framework agreement. In the framework agreement, it says, it's just a majority of whoever shows up to vote. <laughs> and that's not terribly protective, particularly when you consider that under Indigenous laws, a no-show is to be counted as a I voted no. In other words, you must have my actual consent, my yes vote, in order to bind me. Uh, and so you have now so many people have said, I don't want this thing. I'm not bothering to show up to vote. Uh, the fact happening now with the new law in place since December that they don't care anymore about that. It's whoever shows up. It's just a majority of whoever's there. That will give effect to a land code. Now it gets even worse because there's a second major part of the new act, and that is, and I've never seen this before in Canadian law. It says that the Canadian courts must, not may, must, as a matter of judicial note, hold that a past land code, like once it's verified, that the vote took place and there was a majority of whoever showed up voted yes. Once that's done and that triggers application of the, uh, of the land code regime, that the court must hold it to be lawful, valid in law, binding. Now, normally someone could challenge to say, no, this isn't a lawful way of doing this. You know, we, we had, for instance, 1,800 eligible voters in. There's no way that 167 could evidence our consent. Furthermore, here's how we uh, provide our consent under our laws. But the court can't entertain that. It must hold that this is valid law. So how it really binds things in, a, in a, a tight way. I mean, there may well be ways at other levels, but the starting position is not uh, asking the court to consider this is lawful and having a debate in court uh, about whether judicial note, uh, which is a discretionary matter of a judge usually, uh, whether that uh, should apply. The courts are being told by federal legislation that they have to hold these land codes to be valid in law. Uh, you know, it would take me much more time to research just the implications of, of, of whether that's even constitutional or not, um, or what the other examples are of where this has been done, if it has been done. As I said, to my knowledge, I'm just not aware, but in other fields of law, perhaps there are, have been um, uh, federal laws passed that tie the hands of judges. It's not usually the case. Uh, you find a discretion of a judge or judges to be hand-tied like that. Um, at least nothing in my training and background and education supports that kind of a, of a law. But it certainly helps 
get these things in place, get the surrenders in place. You know, this is a type of surrender. So, you know, there's, sur there's surrenders absolute, which is a sale. There's surrenders by designation, which is leasing. There's this surrender by way of land code, which is also a type of surrender. Now, under the Crown's practices and requirements, it's always been 50% plus one to evidence consent, but not now in terms of land code. Um, why is that? I can only surmise that uh, Canada's thinking, well, they're surrendering it to themselves or something of that nature. So it doesn't involve uh, Crown lawyers, because of course they're not in this picture at all. Uh, there's no um, fiduciary duty owed here. Maybe this is the, the the hat rack they're hanging on, um, but like I said, I'm just I'm just shocked. Uh, and 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 what's really suspicious about this is absolutely no coverage on it. Even the law firms that uh, are you know I've come across a couple of commentaries on these changes. They don't highlight these things because of course these benefit their clients who are developing on reserve that want land codes in place they're doing deals with these corporations to make sure everything's solid so why would they point out uh, the downside uh, for um, the indian bands involved the band members involved in their reserve lands so uh, big warning here uh, if land codes being developed remember band council can simply put you put you under that framework get the money to develop this stuff and then hold a vote and you know what if there wasn't proper notice no one really knew about this it just kind of happened and you know band council's family or whatever showed up and and voted and no one really else knew what was happening or what it was about um, there's really no way to challenge that because the courts have been told you must accept this as valid law you can't have someone coming forward and suggesting, oh, we didn't know about it. There was no notice. We didn't have proper whatever, right? Because it falls on the task of the verifier to say, oh, yeah, you know, this was held and it was, you know, nothing else would have changed kind of thing. This is all valid. And they sign off. Um, a vote was held. Here we are. Here we now have a land code. It's an outrage, quite frankly. Uh, I don't see this as lawful but this is what the Trudeau government has passed and on the one hand saying oh we're going to um, apologize for all these different things we're going to support um, um, indigenous nations or what however they're wording it but yet sneak this kind of thing in not even on a direct bill I don't even know if people realize this had happened so it, it, I didn't even, with, with um, recently, just recently became aware that this had happened in December. I wasn't actually aware until after this vote happened with Russell River that they would take this simple majority. I really didn't believe that. I had to go and dig through the frame, original framework agreement and see it's there. There is one clause, however, in um, uh, the framework agreement that is now the binding law that says if before the vote is held, a band council can determine what threshold has to be met. But here's the thing, a band council is an Indian Act creation. It is not um, uh, an original nation governing body. It's the people, the nation, who decide if they're going to surrender something by whatever means, for whatever purposes. Uh, how is it that an Indian Act Band Council can dictate, if they choose, dictate a threshold? Um, that doesn't make any, that's just further interference in Indigenous governance. And that's all I have to say.